You're listening to The Unsafe Bible with Pastor Ken Brown. Now, wait a minute. God promised that Messiah was going to come through David. Obviously not through these guys. They were that bad. Does this mean that Satan had won at this point? And Messiah, who's going to be king, and is supposed to come out of the line of Judah, specific the line of David, is out. Hardly. The Lord set the groundwork up hundreds of years before with an event that you kind of pass over when you study it. Did you hear that? God laid the groundwork for Jesus' arrival hundreds of years before he was born. How? In today's message, Pastor Ken goes over the genealogy of Jesus by tracing certain events that led back to the time of Moses in the book of Numbers and Jesus' stepfather, Joseph. We find out that Joseph is related to King David from the book of 1 and 2 Samuel. Pastor Ken reminds you that God promised David the Messiah would come from his family line. And because of Moses, the prophecy is complete. Well, let's join Pastor Ken in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 19, as he continues his message, like leader, like follower. After the death of Pharaoh Necho, Jehoiakim just kept operating this way. And the new leadership, Nebuchadnezzar, he did not want to operate that way. Nebuchadnezzar did not operate the same way that the Egyptians did. So in Ezekiel 19, 8, it says, The nations set against him on every side from their provinces, spread their net over him, he was captured in their pit. That's it for Jehoiakim. Babylon with their allies roll in and take care of this guy. And Jeremiah actually gives us a short history of the event. Jeremiah 22, 17 to 19 is where Jeremiah gives us some of the background on this. But your eyes and your heart are intent only upon your own dishonest gain. Great when the prophet talks about a king like that, right? And on shedding innocent blood and on practicing oppression and extortion. He really liked this guy. You can tell. Therefore, thus says the Lord in regard to Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. They will not lament for him. Alas, my brother, or alas, sister. They will not lament for him. Alas, for the master, or alas, for his splendor. He'll be buried with a donkey's burial, dragged off and thrown out beyond the gates of Jerusalem. And what we see in verse 8, again, is the same language that was used to capture a dangerous animal. The idea of this verse is that there's a grand hunt, they surround an unusually fierce and dangerous animal, and then they capture him. And he's talking about the king, one of the kings of Israel, uh, using that language. Nebuchadnezzar obviously intended to take the guy prisoner. We don't know whether or not he took him to Babylon, brought him back. We don't know what happened. All we know is that three months later, he's come back to take Jehoiachin, his son, who was out doing his dad, because he had gotten the word that Jehoiachin wasn't doing much better either. But we do know that he was probably killed somewhere outside of the city of Jerusalem and was buried like a donkey was, just as the scripture says. In 2 Chronicles 36, 5 to 8, we see a little bit more about this guy. Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he became king, reigned 11 years in Jerusalem, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord his God. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against him and bound him with bronze chains to take him to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar also brought some of the articles of the house of the Lord to Babylon and put them in his temple at Babylon. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoiakim and the abominations which he did, and what was found against him, behold, they're written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah. And Jehoiachin, his son, became king in his place, but only for a few months. So, yeah, some people say he was drug off like a wild beast with an iron collar around his neck and that killed him, could have been. Or they brought him back. We don't know. We're not clear. He, they tried to take him away and he didn't survive all the way to Babylon. That, that we do know. But being taken away in chains is also the fate of Jehoiachin and it'll be the fate of Zedekiah as well. Again, Jehoiachin only lasts a few months. He is worse than his dad. And Zedekiah lasts a few years. Both go to captivity in Babylon. Both never return to Israel because it says their voices will never be heard on the mountains of uh, Israel again in verse 9. So needless to say, it literally occurred based on what the scripture says here. Now, if Jehoiachin 
acted just like his dad, and the scriptures indicate that he did. It's no wonder that Nebuchadnezzar basically came back and replaced him pretty quick. What's the Lord's view of Jeconiah? How bad is this guy? Now remember, he's also called Coniah. That's another of his names. So in Jeremiah 22, verses 24 to 30, we get this. As I live, declares the Lord, even though Coniah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were a signet ring on my right hand, yet I would pull you off and I'd give you over into the hand of those who were seeking your life. Yes, into the hand of those whom you dread, even into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and into the hand of the Chaldeans. I will hurl you and your mother who bore you into another country where you were not born, and there you will die. The Lord's real impressed with him. But as for the land to which they desire to return, they will not return to it. Is this man, Coniah, a despised, shattered jar, or is he an undesirable vessel? Why have he and his descendants been hurled out and cast into a land that they had not known? O land, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Then this comes up. Thus says the Lord, write this man down childless, a man who will not prosper in his days, for no man of his descendants will prosper sitting on the throne of David or ruling again in Judah. Now, Jehoiachin is a descendant of David. Isn't the Messiah supposed to come from David, right? He is. But God here pronounces a blood curse on that line. Specifically, Jeconiah or Coniah says there will be no ruler coming from you at all. And by the way, if you study the scriptures carefully, that's a true statement. It didn't happen. There are no rulers coming from Coniah. The activities of the kings, these guys, had gotten so bad that God now has to pronounce a blood curse on them and say, Messiah is not going to be coming through this line. Now, wait a minute. God promised that Messiah was going to come through David. Obviously not through these guys. They were that bad. Does this mean that Satan had won at this point? And Messiah, who's going to be king, and is supposed to come out of the line of Judah, specifically the line of David, is out. Hardly. The Lord set the groundwork up hundreds of years before, with an event that you kind of pass over when you study it. In Numbers 27, verses 7 to 11, the nation is wandering around in the wilderness. They're getting ready to enter the land. They're trying to determine what inheritance is going to be. And this group of daughters show up. There are no sons to this family. They're just girls. The daughters of Zelophehad are right in their statements. And these, these women show up and they say, look, we need an inheritance. How are you going to take care of us? We don't have any. There's no sons in this family. And in Israel, if you don't have sons, then you, you just lose out. So they appealed to Moses and Moses talked to God. And this is God's statement back. They're right. You shall surely give them a hereditary possession among their father's brothers. And you shall transfer the inheritance of their father to them. Further, you shall speak to the sons of Israel saying, if a man dies and has no son, then you shall transfer his inheritance to his daughter. If he has no daughter, then you shall give his inheritance to his brothers. If he has no brothers, then you shall give his inheritance to his father's brothers. If his father has no brothers, then you shall give his inheritance to his nearest relative in his own family, and he shall possess it, and it shall be a statutory ordinance to the sons of Israel, just as the Lord commanded Moses. So here we have in the Old Testament women inheriting in a culture where that doesn't happen, but God's looking out for them. Now, in 2 Samuel 7, verses 8 to 17, this is where we see that David is, the Messiah is supposed to come from the line of David. Therefore you shall say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hope, hosts, I took you from the pasture from following the sheep to be ruler over my people Israel. I've been with you wherever you've gone, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. I'll make you a great name, like the names of the great men who are on the earth. I will also appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, that they may live in their own place and not be disturbed again. Nor will the wicked afflict them any more as formerly, even from the day that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel. And I'll give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord also declares to you that the Lord will make a house for you. When your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendants after you who will come forth from you and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name 
and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I will correct him with the rod of men and the strokes of the sons of men. But my loving kindness shall not depart from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words and all this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. So we have a messianic promise to King David that Messiah will come through his line. And you're still sitting there going, what's this have to do with the daughters of Zelophehad? Yeah, I, I get that. We'll get there. So David was promised an eternal throne. Messiah is going to come through him. But we just saw that Jeconiah is so bad, who's the subject of this dirge being written by Ezekiel, that God has put a blood curse on him, is at the end. But we still have these daughters of Zelophehad thing going on. So let's take a look at the Messiah's genealogy. By the way, there are two of them. One's in the book of Matthew. And we'll pick it up with Jesse. Okay, Jesse's David's dad. And we see it goes Jesse, David the king, Solomon by Bathsheba, and all of these different names, which I'm not going to read into until I get to the next page. And at the bottom you see Jacob, Joseph, Messiah. Okay? So you see that it's Jesse, David, Solomon, Jacob, Joseph, Messiah. So is Joseph of the line of David? Obviously, he is. Is he the father of Jesus? No. He is the stepfather. He's the father in name, but he's not the natural father. Of course, the Holy Spirit is the one that came over Mary. Though Joseph would, through Joseph though, Jesus would be subject to the blood curse, would he not? Because remember, he comes from the line of Solomon, which includes Jeconiah, who's in that line. But let's take a look at Luke's genealogy. It's a little different. Again, it starts at Jesse. David. Who's the next name after David? Nathan, not Solomon. Different person. All of a sudden, the line goes to the left, not to the right. And we see all these different folks in, as part of the line. And then when you get to the last portion of it, Mathot, Eli, Joseph, Messiah. It's totally different people. And, and you go, wow, that's kind of different. Well, I mean, it says that he's the Messiah, he's from the line of David, but we've got two genealogies, one going through Solomon and Joseph's reference, and in this one we see Joseph referenced, but what's going on? Due to the ruling God made in favor of the daughters of Zelophehad, we see this. It became tradition that the father of the daughter, he has no sons, would adopt his son-in-law to make sure that then his son-in-law could inherit whatever he would have gone, that his daughter would have inherited. What we're seeing in the genealogy of the Messiah is that exact thing happening. In Ezra 2.61, it says, Of the sons of the priests, the sons of Habiah, the sons of Hakaz, the sons of Barzali, who took a wife from the daughters of Barzali, the Gileadite, he was called by their name. What we see in that verse in Ezra is that adoption taking place, literally taking place. In Luke 3.23, it says when, Jesus, when he began his ministry, Jesus himself was about 30 years of age, being, in the Greek, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, the son of Eli. Supposed is the word nomitso in the Greek, which means by law or by custom. He was the adopted, Joseph was the adopted son of Eli. He's the natural son of through the line of Solomon, but he was adopted by Eli as part of their culture because Eli had no sons. So he adopted his son-in-law to make sure that his daughter would be able to inherit from him. And as a result, Messiah is through the line of David, through Nathan, not through Solomon. But both lines come to meet, and it's really interesting how the rabbis put this all together and the Holy Spirit, just you know, all these coincidences, right? But Joseph was the adopted son of Eli, so she would not lose it. So as a result of the daughters of Zelophehad, Jesus meets the prophecy from Messiah two ways. And the prophecy to David is not abrogated. Yeah, the, the Messiah is going to come through the line of David, but not through Solomon. It comes through Nathan. 
Yes, Jesus is virgin born, yet he becomes the heir because of the adoption. The fact that the final kings were so totally corrupt and subject to a blood curse from God doesn't stop the promise of God or the coming of the Messiah. It just doesn't. God had another planet in, in, in line the whole time. But when you stop and you take a look at the kind of leadership, the kind of kings these guys were, it's no wonder that the people, as we saw last week, had problems with personal responsibility. The kings didn't exercise any personal responsibility, none whatsoever. And the people who we talked about last week needing personal responsibility are just doing what their leaders have shown them to do. That's not an issue we see anymore, is it? Unfortunately, it is. We still see that even today, and, and, and it's, it's possible with bad leaders, you wind up having people who start copying them. Uh, we see a bit more fully the, fully the reason for comparison in chapter 16 of the book of Ezekiel that the political life of Israel at this time is compared to prostitution. Israel was paying all this money, and they didn't receive the benefits of anything. So verse 10, the picture shifts. So we've got all this stuff about lions in the first nine verses, and then in verse 10, it shifts around to agriculture. Different version. Your mother was like a vine in your vineyard, planted by the waters. It was fruitful and full of branches because of abundant waters. And it had strong branches fit for scepters of rulers. And its height was raised above the clouds so that it was seen in its height with the mass of its branches. But it was plucked up in fury. It was cast down to the ground and the east wind dried up its fruit. Its strong branch was torn off so that it withered. The fire consumed it, and now it's planted in the wilderness in a dry and thirsty land. And fire has gone out from its branch, so it has consumed its shoots and fruit, so that there's not a strong branch, a scepter to rule. This is a lamentation and has become a lamentation. So we have the picture that shifts now to the unified kingdom. We, all of a sudden, we're back to the time of David. And, and we see in, in this, this word picture, your mother was like a vine in your vineyard planted by waters, fruitful and full of branches. So we get a quick history about the rulers of Israel in these few verses. Initially, everything was positive under the rule of David and Solomon. Planted by waters, it was fruitful. The nation was growing. They almost expanded to the point that they were fulfilling the prophecies of the scriptures in terms of what their land mass was going to be. They never quite hit it, but they got close. They were planted by waters, fruitful, full of branches. A really good start is what the prophet's telling us here. I mean, a really good start. The many waters signifies the divine blessing which ruled over Israel, the grace of God that was overseeing them. Verse 11 specifically talks about the glorious condition of the people in the time of David and Solomon under under those two kings, Israel became a world power, almost like Assyria, the same, uh, you know, which is said in chapter 31, verse 3. Remember, though, what happened towards the end of the reign of Solomon. He had a few problems, didn't he? Uh, all of the kings, including Solomon, knew better, but they all became victims of the culture. At least that's what they would tell you. And they listened to their advisors rather than to the Lord. Now, in Deuteronomy 17, here's what the kings were supposed to do. When you enter the land which the Lord your God gives you, and you possess it and live in it, and you say, I'll set a king over me like all the nations who are around me, you shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses. One from among your countrymen you shall set as king over yourselves. You may not put a foreigner over yourselves who's not your countryman. Moreover, he shall not multiply horses for himself. Okay, Solomon several thousand horses. He, nor shall he cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. Well, he bought them from Egypt. Um, since the Lord has said to you, you shall never again return that way. He shall not multiply wives for himself, or else his heart will turn away. Remember we said Josiah had at least two wives? Nor shall he greatly increase silver and gold for himself. Solomon's pay that he received every year was 666 talents of gold a year. That was his body weight in gold. That's what he got paid. That's about, uh, he got about three and a half billion dollars in today's money. Great gig if you can get it. But it says it's not supposed to happen. 
Now it shall come about when he sits on the throne of the kingdom, he shall write for himself a copy of the law, of this law on a scroll. Do we, have we read anywhere in the scripture where any of these kings sat down and took the entire law and wrote it out themselves by hand on a scroll? It doesn't show up anywhere in the scripture. They never did it. He's supposed to do it in the presence of the Levitical priests. It shall be with him and he shall read it all the days of his life. Josiah didn't even know what it was until somebody came in and said, look what I found in the temple. And he's supposed to follow it and fear the Lord his God by carefully observing all the words of this law and these statutes that his heart may not be lifted up above his countrymen and that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right or the left so that he and his sons may continue long in his kingdom in the midst of Israel. Now, we see what the kings are supposed to do. Remember, it says here in chapter 19 that they started off really well, but then they kind of fell off. How did Solomon do? He's the second king, David then Solomon, okay? David had a lot of wives, but Solomon had, well, you'll see here. Verse 1 of chapter 11 of First Kings. King Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, Hittite women, six right there, from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the sons of Israel, you shall not associate with them, nor shall they associate with you, for they shall surely turn your heart away after their gods. Solomon held fast to these in love. He had 700 wives, princesses, I don't know how you could do that, 300 concubines, and his wives turned his heart away, you think? For when Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away after other gods. Solomon did not end well. His heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father had been. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, after Milcom, the detestable idol of the Ammonites. Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not follow the Lord fully as David his father had done. Just one generation, okay? Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable idol of Moab, on the mountain which is east of Jerusalem, and for Molech, the detestable idol of the sons of Ammon. Thus also he did for all his foreign wives who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. Now the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he did not observe what the Lord had commanded. So the Lord said to Solomon, because you've done this and have not kept my covenant and my statutes which I've commanded you, I will tear the kingdom from you, I'll give it to your servant. Nevertheless, I won't do it in your days for the sake of your father David, but I'll tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I'll not tear away all the kingdom, but I'll give one tribe to your son for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I've chosen. Nice guy. He failed. And we see in 1 Kings chapter 12, it gets worse. Uh, Israel, the northern kingdom, saw that the king did not listen to them. The people answered the king saying, what portion do we have in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. Uh, to your tents, O Israel, now look after your own house, David. So basically we say, we're going home, take care of yourself, we're leaving. So Israel departed to their tents. But for the sons of Israel who lived in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. Then King Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was over the forced labor, and all Israel stoned him to death. King Rehoboam uh, was a nice guy. Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. It came about when all Israel heard that Jeroboam had returned, that they sent and called him to the assembly and made him king over all Israel. But the tribe of Judah followed the house of David. Today's message was in the book of Ezekiel. Pastor Ken continues his teaching from this major prophet here on the Unsafe Bible. Ezekiel provides many reminders of what it means to be a Christian. Even more impressive is how relevant his example is even today. Not only did he embody what would later be known as a disciple, but he spoke of the end times that would later be penned in the book of Revelation. He also embodies what we mean when we say the unsafe Bible. The Jews were saved by faith and blessed with a paradise to live in. This was not popular among the locals. And so little by little, they began to deny their faith and take credit for themselves. This gained them favor with the world, but God took notice and knew what he must do. You see, the life of a Christian is not an easy one. 
Not only do you have to deny yourself things of this world, but the world begins to look at you differently, and that can be uncomfortable at times. We want to help you navigate what it means to be a Christian today and to walk in lockstep with God. Visit our website, theunsafebible.com, for more information about us and the Bible. You can connect with us by filling out the Connect form right on the main page. You'll find directions to our campus on the About tab under Contact Us. There's also a link to our email address where you can ask questions or leave a prayer request. We can't wait to hear from you and start a conversation. But for now, we're out of time. Be sure to come back for more from Pastor Ken on the Unsafe Bible.